Good afternoon, and welcome to the Atlantic Council. Thanks to all of you for coming. I'm Steve Grundman, the Lund Fellow for Emerging Defense Challenges uh, here at the Atlantic Council. I'm also the producer of this, which we call the Captains of Industry series. Our purpose today is to hear from the head of Lockheed Martin's space systems business, Richard Ambrose, uh, who will make an address and have a discussion with us about how his company and the space industry in general can thrive in what each week uh, seems to manifest new indications of a rapidly evolving space sector. Um, thank you very much, Rick, for coming, making the time uh, to uh, speak on, at this series here at the Council. Uh, before we launch <coughs> into this discussion, I feel compelled to make several administrative notes. Uh, first, the agenda, which is very straightforward. Uh, during the first third of these 75 minutes, uh, Rick will deliver some prepared remarks, and he has pictures, which are great. Uh, you can look forward to that. Uh, and the remarks, too, rest assured, but I'm just telling that pictures are killer. Um, uh, following which, he and I will sit down in these chairs for a short conversation that runs across the middle third of the program. And then in the final third of the program, for the last 15 or 20 minutes, I, uh, we will uh, uh, take questions from those of you here in the audience. So hang in there. Uh, I won't forget. Somewhere around uh, 530, uh, 525, 530, we'll, we'll uh, 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 turn the switch and take questions from the audience. Um, second, second administrative note. Uh, please, uh, we all should understand that the event is entirely public and on the record. Uh, moreover, we are live streaming the event over that camera there. Um, this fact, of course, holds greatest significance for Rick, uh, on the one hand, uh, but it, uh, if I should call upon you uh, during the Q&A, uh, please do, in consideration of the fact that it's public on the record, identify yourself, wait, wait for a microphone. Um, if you need to wait, one of our staff will bring you a microphone, identify yourself and where you're from uh, before you ask your question. Third administrative note is that we are tweeting this event over the hashtag AC Defense. All right, I got it right this time. We are tweeting this over the hashtag AC Defense, and we can even take a question across that channel. Uh, and if it's a good question, the staff will bring it to me, and maybe I will infiltrate it into the conversation that we're having with Rick in that second and third uh, parts of the program. Finally, uh, the event must conclude by 545, uh, so please work with me to pace your questions at the end of the program as we approach that deadline. I'll appreciate that very much. T today's event marks what I think is the 15th uh, address in this Captains of Industry series, uh, the purpose of which, the purpose of the series, is to make available what I immodestly regard as this town's preeminent platform from which senior executives whose businesses address aerospace and defense can address the public interests their companies serve and the public policies that shape their markets. The space sector has figured prominently among the guests in this series already. Last fall, uh, the series featured a panel discussion with CEOs from Intelsat, Xcore, Artel, and even another executive from Lockheed Martin um, in a conversation entitled The New Space Race in Business. A year earlier, the then new CEO of United Launch Alliance, Tony Bruno, uh, was on this stage to make an address. And in the series' first year, uh, the president, I think chief operating officer of SpaceX, Gwynne Shotwell, was here. So space has figured prominently, and, and fittingly so, in this Captains of Industry series, and uh, today marks another uh, notch in that, uh, in that trend line. Uh, by engaging the perspectives of these business leaders, our Captains of Industry series is cultivating, I hope, a constituency for practical solutions to the challenges and opportunities lying at the interface of ministries and industries. As the invitation to this event stated, the space sector has, somewhat unexpectedly for me, I suppose, I, I'll confess, become one of the most dynamic corners of the aerospace and defense marketplace. That dynamism is marked most especially by the entry of new firms, uh, conceiving new products and services to address the changing tastes and preferences of business and consumers, both for information here on Earth and specialized services in space. There's at least that. But, um, it's also marked, this dynamism, by the restructuring and repositioning of established players in the market who are both defending their incumbencies and breaking into new lanes of the market themselves. I think Rick's going to talk about all that. Not least, this dynamism is abetted by governments whose influence uh, manifests itself both in the form of uh, their behavior as customers for these products and services, but also as regulators uh, of what and how these companies conduct themselves in space. Um, it was no more recently than Saturday that I woke up and saw this article on what, at least on my online version, was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, U.S. set to approve moon mission by commercial space venture. 
Um, this is just yet another of what, again, strikes me as an almost weekly manifestation of, of dynamism um, and things afoot. Things are afoot in space, if that's not a mixed metaphor. Um, Rick is here to lend uh, Lockheed Martin his own personal and Lockheed Martin's perspective on that theme, which is great. Uh, permit me now to welcome him uh, and more properly introduce him uh, to the begin the substantive part of the program. Uh, Rick Ambrose is Executive Vice President of the Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company and he's an officer of the Lockheed Martin Corporation. Previously, he was President of Lockheed Martin Information Systems and Global Solutions. Uh, Rick also served as Vice President and General Manager of the company's surveillance and navigation systems line within the space systems company. He is a, uh, if you'll permit me to say it this way, an old hand in the space I industry as Rick. Um, and, and I've not even mentioned uh, his life before Lockheed Martin, uh, which included uh, a, a history at Raytheon and one of its heritage companies, uh, Hughes. Um, he chairs the Sandia Corporation Board of Directors and the United Launch Alliance Board of Directors and also serves as a board member for the Space Foundation. Finally, he chairs the World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council on Space. We're really pleased to have him here. Thanks very much, Rick. Look forward to the program. Thank you, Steve. You're welcome. Thank you, Steve. Uh, I appreciate that kind introduction, the reference to being old. It might be the gray hair or something there. I don't know. Uh, welcome, everybody here in the room and those folks uh, that are online out there uh, today. I'm really excited to be here and share perspectives and the kind of things we're doing to uh, navigate and lead in this uh, kind of transforming uh, environment here around space uh, in the mini, as you mentioned, uh, Steve mentioned here, a lot of changes that are transpiring. Uh, for many years, uh, space has led knowledge, and I do think it's part of that uh, innovative platform or engine that can help lead aerospace and defense, you know, as we go forward. Um, clearly, space drives economies. Uh, I don't think I need to tell this group or many people around that might be online, Space enables a lot of economies. You look at GPS, you look at GOES, the communication systems, remote sensing, and now we're going to have, uh, you know, hopefully a private company, the first one in the moon. I think that's pretty exciting. But it's a changing environment, and the space sector is constantly evolving, as you all know that. So I thought I should touch on that, uh, how it's evolving uh, as we move forward. Uh, as you all know, it's going through a dynamic period of change. Uh, matter of fact, I'd propose that there's... Uh, no one element of the space segment that's not under some kind of transformative pressure. You can start the Department of Defense. Uh, the mission demand uh, on, the US, on the government is extreme at a time we have flat, if not declining budgets, and possibly budgets that are near a 30-year low as they invest in these accounts. That's a big challenge we have to adapt. You're also going to look at NASA. Uh, NASA's led the way in just about every element of space from a civil and exploration side. They're trying to move out, go deep space exploration at the same time position and engender and enable all of that commercial, uh, commercialization, at least of LEO, now the moon, and, and maybe uh, even further. Uh, the commercial segment's under tremendous competitive pressure, both com competition from within their own uh, industry segment but they're seeing substitution pressure from uh, terrestrial systems and Wi-Fi and streaming in, in those areas. And of course, as uh, Steve mentioned, it's attracting new entrants. Entrepreneurs are coming into the space, new startups, uh, which is exciting, right? Uh, probably depending on what number you pull, you could say there's been two to three billion of additional startup capital put into these companies uh, outside some of the bigger investments uh, in some of the launch areas. So you kind of, Look at those challenges, and you start wondering, so why space attracting everybody? <laughs> well, aside from it's exciting, uh, space has been, has been one of the fastest growing sectors uh, in the world. Uh, if you look at the, the growth rate here from the Space Foundation, uh, puts out annual reports, 10% growth rate from 2013 to 2014, and grew again in 2015. Uh, and it's now hit about $323 billion uh, in uh, 2015. Last year, the commercial sector represented around three quarters of that global space economy of around $247 billion. The global government budgets are around uh, $77 billion. And uh, part of the, the, probably part of the space that's most visible being launched, and there are 86 uh, launch attempts uh, in, in 15 
as the Space Foundation report sets out, there are 19 countries emerging and would like to either have launch sites or, or create launch sites across the sector. So let's take a look at that for a minute. Let's see, we have customers that have high demand needs, want more services, they want lower prices. At the same time, there's new entrants, more competition. Kind of sounds like almost every other industry, right? <laughs> And I think I saw this, uh, some media here around today. Uh, probably the most visible it's affected by this and the digital transformation is media. You look at the speed of knowledge, the social media that's affected, it's having to change total business paradigms uh, you know, across the, the whole community is huge. And those same transformative pressures exist today. Now, so how do you thrive? <laughs> but Change is opportunity, and that change is, uh, can be excited. So the first thing I want to hit, we have three major topics here I'll touch on before we go into Q&A. Uh, the first one you probably heard over and over again, but it's very serious. You have to confront the status quo. Uh, demand, demand for both technical innovation and business innovation is very key. And you have to go after this to grow. And in some cases, uh, it may not be growth, it may be just staying competitive with your existing uh, 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 opportunities. So we have to rethink everything and drive innovation, drive affordability, which is really being able to be competitive and deliver more capability for the same, same amount of money. So the value space to us uh, is very important end-to-end -end, uh, capability. And I want to share a little bit. You mentioned I was on chair of the, space, the Global Agenda Council on Space, and that's uh, through the World Economic Forum. One of the focuses of that group was how you bring space down to Earth and how is the benefit of space, because many, many uh, folks still do not understand the benefit uh, uh, of space, whether it be in communications or navigation, uh, some of the, a lot of the work NASA does with uh, its remote sensing work and produ producing products to help with agricultural uh, uh, elements and stuff is just not known. So we've focused on that heavily. So the first part I'm going to talk about is the ground <laughs> and bringing end to end and solutions. Uh, uh, General Hyten talked about this in some of his. Uh, 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 space uh, enterprise vision that a lot of times the grounds so you all know about it so uh, you got to communicate with the satellite you have to have systems for that you have to do command and control and mission planning and tie it together but they're very unique and so part of that which we would agree with is we need to get the standards put together that whole enterprise so satellites can interoperate with one another because that'll help bring costs down because uh, the value is in the information or the capability, uh, not in building a bunch of systems that get, you know, to integrate across very differential uh, platforms. So the ground architectures are really key. It, it'll give us tremendous advantage for sustainment and that resilience. And by coupling that with the activities we're doing in the, around the space sector will allow us to drive some of those costs down, those on-orbit platforms. Imagine if we can build a satellite that has a standard interface. I mean, if you think about that, you on the internet, uh, you, there's no one integrating you in the internet. You either comply with the standard interface with it or you don't get to interact with it. We need to get to a point there with the, some of these standards and it'll really affect those costs. Now another area that we're really excited about is driving products faster. One thing that's challenged space uh, is the fact that you don't do high volume production, right? You're not doing a thousand, like a thousand, you might do 10,000 airplanes, you might do two. So space has been kind of around a trade craft status. And uh, what we need to do is get the effect of production if we can. And that's through this 3D printing. And we've been heavily investing in this for many years uh, in, in repurposing uh, the 3D printing investments. Some of the commercial sectors are making, but we have to repurpose it to our needs, like printing titanium. You say, why would you print? Well, we can print a titanium tank that would normally take 24 months. We'll have it ready to go in under three months. That gives us the effect of scale as we go forward. So that's a major area uh, that we don't have to machine out of blocks of material. Um, text, you can quickly uh, repurpose. By the way, it's very sustainable because the material you don't reuse, you, 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 you can uh, plug it back into the next uh, piece you're trying to make. An example of that and, and the change is we're pretty proud of is on Juno. So while I may not have the most volume of 3D printed parts, we have the part that has flown the furthest with partnership with NASA. 
So when it, it will hit 1.7 uh, billion miles uh, when it enters the atmosphere or enters the orbit of uh, around Jupiter uh, here on July 4th. So while many of you are about being fireworks, we will be glued to terminals, uh, which takes uh, about 48 seconds to get the signal, yes, it's good and it's uh, in orbit on July 4th. And I'm sure uh, most of NASA is probably going to be doing the same thing with us. But if you think about that, and this is a first, uh, when we go out to Jupiter here, you've got uh, the first solar panel, uh, you know, uh, probe going out to uh, the outer atmosphere, outer planets. You've got, uh, it's going to be the first to do pole-to-pole -pole, uh, orbit and scanning uh, and getting information around Jupiter, uh, outside of Earth, of course. Uh, touch the cloud tops. It's a very high radiation environment, so uh, we'll put, uh, uh, you may not notice, the titanium vault to protect it. And it will be the fastest when it enters the orbit at uh, about 130,000 miles an hour. So it's going to do a lot of science uh, for NASA and support there and the JPL, and we're pretty excited about that and, and as we demonstrate the 3D uh, printed parts. The second area I want to talk about is embracing change. Uh, so you kind of listen to that, you get that paradox, decline budgets, but you have more demand and more expectation. But I don't think that's that un, uh, uncommon amongst uh, any industry that, that we go face. So you really uh, need to get in there and uh, attack that um, change, and it's, and it's, and it's a, a uh, broadband change, right? So first thing we kind of do is reshape the operations, and uh, we want to move more and more processes into a digital domain. It's really that digital transformation that everyone's experiencing. I mentioned, even the me I mentioned about the media and other folks that are going through that. But we're actually embracing and driving it in this digital technology by looking at all stages of that development. We call this digital tapestry. So from upfront, from the engineering uh, and, and designs and models, virtualizing that uh, in, in a, a computer space, still test it, will that work? and driving down to manufacturing. And a as we move forward uh, in, in not just manufacturing, also our supply chain we're gonna need to get to as we go in and improve these ideas and bring in the, all this to life. Because now we can simulate that. And not only can we simulate it, we can immerse a human being into it. So we developed several years ago, been perfecting a thing we call CHILL. And uh, it's a computer human immersive lab, or CHILL. And uh, this is the thing where you see a gentleman up here with his eyes. He is immersed in a satellite design. And what you don't see off to the side, there's a group of people watching him act on that satellite design to see his avatar and how he works in there. We've actually used this for doing uh, very difficult integration, uh, manufacturing and th uh, activities in there. And it's a hands-on way. Uh, just in the last few weeks, we've released the next version of this. So once a tech goes in and works out a complex maneuver, now we can actually hit a button and the computer will remember all those moves. It will print out the work instructions when the tech actually goes and touches real hardware. Because again, we're not building many of these to pull in. We need to protect them, uh, you know, do high quality work without damaging hardware. Uh, and this is our way of uh, approaching that for the, the long run. Um, one other interesting feature here is uh, you can, and Orion actually is featured in this uh, many times for those of you who work in the Orion program, if, if, uh, or NASA, you can actually walk into the design. So if you think about like an MRI or a CAT scan, you can actually walk into this. Now if you have a little balance problem, we need to have a chair for you to hang on to because it can throw you off uh, kilter a little bit. But it's very good, uh, we're having design reviews using that technology. Um, our new hires love this uh, quite a bit. It's quite motivating for them. Uh, the next step of that is using a uh, kind of moving the manufacturing side using a tablet to kind of uh, revolution, uh, kind of revolutionary ways to how the technicians, and manufacturing people, you work in the production floor. Uh, so now you have a you've done this from an engineering sense. Now a manufacturer can use that tablet interact with the design, they can actually take a, a picture of what they've done, they can integrate this, they can upload this, and help with the, with the, uh, with the you know, manufacturing of these things and innovations as we move forward. Uh, and they can do the threads. In some cases, we directly aid them as they assemble things. And you know, automotive companies are doing this, and I think airlines, where 
it's going through an image as they're doing the work. So it's scanning the picture of the device they're working on and overlaying the uh, graphics to walk them through the step-by-step. -step. It's a very productive, powerful approach. And then uh, another element around this uh, digital tapestry is moving into um, kind of the robotics uh, for the additive manufacturing. So you'll see a picture up there of two robo robo uh, robotic arms. One is actually laying the material down. So you talk about 3D printers, right? You're used to seeing those, and you probably see them advertised. In this case, you put the print head at the end of a robotic arm. It starts printing up material. Now we have a second robot that's inspecting it and, and applying a, a machine tool or whatever to trim it, to process it uh, as we go forward. And you see a material here is building up, was actually building up for a small sat. So we're at a point now for small structures and things, we can actually uh, print that up. And, of course, where there is a very robust qualification process we're working through for many of our folks. Uh, another I want to talk about is uh, collaboration and adopt common products. I mentioned a lot of times there's trade craft, and we like seeing a lot of variation. Uh, so we've taken a, a pretty major investment in our uh, 2100 platform. If you know, uh, for those of you, if you watch Lockheed Martin, we've we had a 2100 site platform. We'd sell commercially. We would repurpose for uh, government use or civil use. Uh, as always, that you know, go, you know, those systems need to be upgraded. So we have recently just modernized that uh, with, with a sizable investment. And part of that was designing for producibility, 50% less parts. Um, you know, we wanted you know, 25% uh, faster delivery, 35% total cost takeout. How do you make it better, faster, and modernize that <laughs> so it can go forward? Uh, we're in a, currently in the process of uh, putting that Sibbers uh, 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 5.6 onto that platform, as well as uh, we have two uh, commercial contracts that will be based on that platform as we go forward. And these can be used for any. We're trying to repurpose standards so it can be used as remote sensing or it can be re uh, used with uh, communication satellites. So both can benefit with that quality and we get this would allow us to get more effective scale again the more common you are in moving into programming. You know, how do you tell a bus it's either in Leo orbit or planetary or geo orbit at that level or reprogramming uh, payloads that we put in there. Uh, we want to do more international cross uh, sector partnership. Um, uh, you know, uh, Charlie Bolden uh, uh, had a quote there to the uh, 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 foreign relations said, you know, he's been blessed to see the planet from space. He, he can attest up here, you don't see borders. But you see a seemingly, you know, at peace, tranquil, beautiful planet. And I think that's important because many of the programs we do, and we have always done jointly uh, uh, with NASA, you have a lot of international uh, components to that. Uh, going forward. Uh, what, one of these um, examples is Orion. Uh, there's UK and European colleagues who are doing an important role in the service module. Uh, that provides critical power, infrastructure, fuel, supplies. Uh, AHF, uh, this is the government's version. Uh, the UK, Netherlands, and Canada all are all partners on the, on the AHF uh, satellite program and have connected to that successfully. GPS-3, uh, while, you know, the uh, United States Air Force led the way, the GPS program, out there's, there's global partnerships uh, such as uh, uh, Galileo and GLONASS and to make sure the civilian signals are shared uh, across the planet. And there's clearly emergent trends in looking at regional security partnerships as uh, different countries launch their own ca uh, capabilities. So many nations in space, uh, expecting to double in about the next 10 years. Uh, so it is going to be an international global endeavor with space. That's exciting. It's going to bring more competition, but also more access uh, as we move forward. The third area, the last I'll, I'll mention, is uh, dreaming big. Uh, we need to uh, focus on those big dreams, going to the moon, going to Mars, but also realistic milestones <laughs> along the way um, as, as we move forward. And, and these have to be very uh, predictable uh, steps we can make. Uh, the first human traveled to space uh, over a half century ago. It's been uh, 16 years uh, since we've set up the International Space Station. Uh, uh, I heard uh, Charlie, speaking of Charlie again, speak uh, 
to a group who said, if you know you have a child 15 years or younger, they don't know of life without someone living in space from some country. And I think that's pretty powerful as we uh, move forward. Now we're going to commercialize LEO. Uh, we've rolled out uh, our Orion pr program. Hopefully everybody saw last year, 2014, uh, December, uh, the launch, successful launch EFT-1. Our teams are hard at work jointly with NASA, working across uh, building out flight components, uh, primary structures, and getting the systems into test, uh, doing acoustic test and integration test and all that with SLS uh, for exciting, hopefully, year in uh, 2018. And, and speaking of that, so we've got Orion crew. Now we need, to, you know, we, want to, we, we need the service modules, and we want to keep them safe and healthy and productive for a three-year journey to Mars. So how do we do that? Well, we recently proposed Mars Base Camp. That builds on incremental uh, deliveries of capability, uh, which start with um, going up to lunar orbit. So some countries may want to go to the surface, some not. Going out with orbit around Mars and being very successful uh, uh, out there with that. Now, wh why do that? Well, I don't know. Um, uh, as you talk to the scientists and engineers, if you go to uh, landing on Mars is difficult. Uh, they tell me it's more difficult than the moon and more difficult than Earth. It's about 1% uh, of the Earth's atmosphere around Mars. So almost uh, too much uh, atmosphere for some methods of landing and uh, not enough for others. So we we're trying to figure out an analogy for that here for you today. And of course, we just acquired Sikorsky, right, helicopters. You know, it's a helicopter with space. I don't know. So I asked, hey, if you flew a helicopter on Mars, you know, what would it take? What would your rotors have to look like at 1% of the atmosphere? Uh, I had no idea I was going to get about uh, three parts of the country where the engineers really like working this and uh, three parts of the country. And so I better mention it because they work so hard to give me the answer. <laughs> So the rotors, you have two choices. You can make the rotors about five times longer or add 23 blades. <laughs> and then you can fly. So uh, I don't know. Maybe someday we'll uh, buzz a Sikorsky around uh, Mars. Uh, probably not in my tenure, though. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but again, uh, uh, we're, we're very uh, keen on the teammates as we manage risk for this as we go forward. Now, all this innovation coming to life, and there's a lot of it, and it's good. Uh, what will the space industry look like 10 to 15 years from now? I think somebody, hopefully we, will be the lead of printing satellites. Uh, maybe not all of it, but we're going to 3D print those satellites. You're going to think you'll see more companies, more unique solutions. I think you're going to see the DOD move to you know, faster update cycles and uh, very proliferated, uh, robust, resilient architectures. Uh, I think we're going to keep exploring uh, uh, through NASA and NASA's leadership, you know, the, the universe uh, as we drive that. Uh, and not in the too distant future, you're going to see someone, a man put, or woman put their foot on Mars, uh, red dust, stepping out of Orion, I will say. Uh, but we need leadership for this uh, as we move forward. Um, progress, discovery, innovation d does not happen by accident. Uh, we have to have a bold vision, but we have to have very practical steps to do it in a very uh, safe uh, uh, and uh, predictable manner as we move forward. Uh, and I get asked, gee, uh, like Martin, you know, you're, you're not a new startup. You know, yeah, we're 104 years old, I guess now, uh, just celebrating that. Uh, so you kind of look back with that. So... Um, We've been on going to Mars and helping NASA go to Mars since 1976. No mission has gone to Mars we haven't had some part of. And uh, the first mission there, obviously, was Viking, uh, first U.S. spacecraft to land on another planet. Uh, of course, those are built by Martin Marietta with Lockheed Martin help on a Titan 3E Centaur, for those of you that <laughs> go, go back that far. Um, uh, Believe it or not, uh, we, we, we started up in, uh, believe it or not, in uh, Sunnyvale, California, Silicon Valley in 1956, uh, moving up from a Southern California garage, the Lockheed Brothers. And when the government uh, had issues with overflight uh, risk, uh, mm -hmm. the corona program was uh, developed out there, of course, working with the Air Force, CIA, and others, and many other companies. Uh, that, that, if you don't know that, that program, that's one where it'd take pictures and drop film and a C-130, another Lockheed Martin product would catch it. <laughs> um, 
first weather satellites more than 50 years ago, uh, starting with the early days of Tyros, DMSP program, Defense Meteorological Support Program, and then uh, GOES-R. And I hope you all can watch the GOES-R launch later this year uh, uh, in the as it gets manifested. And again, we support NOAA with all those, and over 100 environmental uh, satellites and pro have been uh, launched or supported by Lockheed Martin. Now, innovations like these are not possible without talented uh, engineers and innovators and looking to the future STEM professionals, uh, which we need a lot of uh, to get the job done. Uh, and we have, uh, and I can't say enough about our engineers, uh, men and women Lockheed Martin, uh, you saw the change we're navigating and, and uh, moving through and they step up to that, as do, you know, employees in other companies. Um, we clearly want to keep driving those space programs, foster understanding of space. Space is very attractive for kids to get them in the STEM uh, programs and things we move forward. Uh, we all have a role to play and I'm confident uh, we can make a difference. Um, so kind of to close up here, because I don't know if I'm over or not, I didn't bring, uh, didn't start the clock there. So you, you haven't yelled at me, so uh, I, I do got time. Okay. <laughs> uh, again, uh, space is a way, you know, we always had that quest is, you know, you know, the universe, how to gear, how's it work and all that. We can unlock the, that knowledge, that base, and it's attractive and it's exciting to go explore. We're kind of explorers as people. And it's eyes, you know, fuel the urge to look over that horizon. Uh, that's why we say we've got to keep challenging the status quo. Whether you had budget pressure or not, we need to keep evolving, keep innovating, keep finding that new way to do things as we move forward and reshape and renew. And business innovation is just as important as technical innovation because sometimes, you know, that you can find a different way to accomplish a project at a much either faster cycle time or, or lower cost. We can accelerate project because we want to be part of that next big leap. And we see that leap uh, going forward with some of the things I just talked about. Some days a lot closer than we think. If you look at the pace of change we talked about, the digital transformation, the innovation, and the capability that not only Lockheed Martin has, but the entire country has to go after tough uh, challenges. So I'm, I'm very excited about these, participate and watch these happen, and especially in my lifetime. I'm really energized about the space in industry, it's exciting uh, attributes it has to offer, great uh, missions it has to do, and the great work uh, even the men and women that serve our, our country uh, participate in that we support. So thank you, and uh, I guess we'll move to the next thing. Great. Here. Uh, that you way? take that one. <laughs> I'll take this one. Is it not Perfect. electrifying? Huh? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, that, that's great. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, the first question I'm going to ask you, uh, uh, I, I might have thought to tip you off on, but I didn't think of it until I saw that last image no. that you were projecting. So I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to strike out anyway. Um, did you see the movie The Martian? I did. Okay. So I, I, guys who really understand what it is to operate in space, and you're one of them, I like asking this question. What did you like about that movie, and what did you not like, maybe even from an engineering point of view? Uh, that's, you didn't tell me you were going to ask me that I question know, in I know, advance. But, but, but now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna stick, <laughs> to stick it on you, because I, I think you probably have some thoughts. You, right? You watched the movie. Yeah, well, it was a very entertaining movie. Um, I thought it was well good, it, very well done. Um, I thought it brought a lot of attention to space across folks. I did get a lot of emails from my engineers about how things weren't quite realistic. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> some of the things, you know, that just happened and the timelines they happened on weren't quite there and um, wouldn't be quite true. Uh, um, I'm not an expert, but at 1% of our atmosphere, I was trying to figure out, uh, you know, some of the wind uh, effects and stuff, but uh, may not be quite there. And, mm -hmm. uh, but other than that, was good. storm at one atmosphere. Is that what you're <laughs> or 1% of the atmosphere. Yeah. But, uh, or, but then uh, again, right. there may be something, you know, one of the scientists know that I don't. Mm -hmm. um, and, and things, I just don't think, uh, yeah, I think there are a couple things in the timelines was a little too quick. And, but other than that, it was entertaining. I enjoyed as, it. as an engineer, it didn't offend you. It wasn't like, ah, oh, God, they're misleading us. When I go to a movie, I'm never offended because <laughs> I'm for entertainment. <laughs> good, fair <laughs> enough. If that's the case, most would offend. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> All right, well, I, I wanted to start with that. Um, I am going to kind of work backwards from, uh, from uh, your, your, uh, your presentation um, 
and pick up a couple of things you said and ask you to develop them. So uh, you mentioned in passing uh, that uh, an important part of your business uh, uh, is in Sunnyvale, mm -hmm. Sunnyvale, California, which for those of you who don't know is right in the heart of what commonly is thought of as Silicon Valley. Um, and so I, I, I wonder if, uh, given that you have an operating business in aerospace there, um, uh, offer me some thoughts on this outreach to Silicon Valley that the Secretary of Defense, the whole of the Department of Defense, but especially uh, the Secretary Carter, has, uh, has made some kind of a signature initiative of his uh, campaign to promote innovation in the Department of Defense. Sure, so I don't know all the specific objectives, but uh, you know we support that outreach. Um, what some people aren't aware, because we've been there so long, we're yeah. part of the Silicon Valley Alliance, which brings companies together. Any given time, we all have three or four projects trying to find a technology that we will repurpose and try and repurpose into the business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's never always a direct uh, um, application of that technology, uh, mostly because a lot of times you know, they're going for scaled uh, kinds of businesses and things. Yeah. But, but we, we're very active with it, as you said, because we've been there for a, uh, quite a long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm always for any way to. Uh, drive more innovation, um, cycle that innovation, and um, and pull in ideas anywhere. We have mentor protege programs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the only thing that sometimes uh, can uh, concern you or would concern me <coughs> is you hear kind of, you know, either or th thinking about what we're going to do. You know, traditional or it's innovative, and, right. and, and an and works really good. Mm -hmm. And for those starting up companies, the reason N works good is most of our, our large firms, not just myself and Northrop Grumman or Boeing, we have mentor protege programs. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go it alone. If you have a great idea and look, test it out and, and it, it's applicable to something, there actually can be either management support or resource support or even sometimes a direct investment right. into those firms. And, and so I, I would, we encourage it uh, as we go. Um, I, I was, uh, talking ahead of time as we were looking through uh, some of the data and stuff, you know, you always wonder what questions the audience might ask, or I was kind of looking at that. But I was, um, this, this came up around this, and, you know, if you go to Martin, you know, they started out in the basement of a church. Mm -hmm. And I found it kind of... Uh, Not a garage, but a church. But a church. <laughs> and the reason I found that interesting is I'm currently right now investing in a company that actually is in the basement of a church in the East Coast uh, because around. they have a very unique technology. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing as big as a plane fit in a... <laughs> yeah. But uh, whatever, but uh, it's, it's a very unique uh, microelectronic technology. Yeah. Well, it certainly st strikes me, and has even before you, you mentioned Sunnydale, that... Um, you know, the aerospace industry is kind of the original Silicon Valley companies, the original high-tech companies, mm -hmm. and your, your business in, Sil in Sunnyvale is really exemplary of that. Yeah, and, and many times because the, the U.S. government usually has very pressing problems that they have to solve, and they're looking for technology. In many cases, uh, they'll come to a larger company, but we're drawing in Mm -hmm. uh, other technologies uh, in, until the commercial sector is large enough. I mean, go to go to workstations and computers, or think about networks, and <clears throat> you know, that was all pioneered, right, mm -hmm. in the U.S. government. Oh, if you want to go civil, civil, right? Uh, we're going to, you know, there's a big push. You know, many many nations, many folks want to go to Mars. Well, there's 40 year, plus years of data and science developed by NASA that they're aiding and helping anybody to get there. We talked about the atmosphere, the temperature, minus 81 degrees, by the way. It's mm. balmy if you want to go visit and, and, and vacation there. Um, you look at you know, the soil types and what you can do and, and, and techniques, uh, the radiation environments. The, uh, they have that uh, information. Mm -hmm. and They will help get there. So NASA leads the way for a commercial to come in in that aspect, just like the U.S. government Department of Defense has led the way in many other aspects. Um, let me stick on public policy for a second and um, uh, ask uh, sometime I would imagine in the next couple of years after, after the end of this administration, a new administration will at least consider uh, brushing up the national space uh, strategy and the national security uh, space strategy. I'm not sure I've got the nomenclature quite right, but these two sort of foundational mm -hmm. public policy documents in space. Um, do, do you, uh, let's see, maybe not your agenda uh, for, for it, unless you want to say you have one, but um, what are the, the issues that you think, you know, a next uh, either national security space or, or general space, uh, federal space strategy ought to, ought to tackle or, or, or take another look at? Yeah. 
Well, I think the, the, the biggest one that's dominant, um, and again, I'm not a policy guy or uh, stuff, so it'll be the that's under the auspices of the government. It's the captains of industry. Series. It's the captains of industry, but I'll just so I'll tell you. <laughs> uh, no, the first one, uh, which I think is already out there, and you know, I don't think it's a surprise to anybody, is space is no longer a sole dominion uh, domain for the U.S. or a couple large uh, countries. Mm -hmm. uh, you're getting many, many countries there. The Leo orbits are very crowded. When you look at you're going to do a launch many times you have uh, debris issues or stay out zones because of debris more than geometry affecting those launches. Yep. So there's going to have to be new policies and governance rules lit written not only for the U.S. but across uh, multinational uh, international standards, right? Sure. You come to agreement. Uh, then you go up and as you, as you all know, there's uh, a lot of frequency uh, uh, spectrum issues and there's also a lot of... Uh, uh, con you know, contention issues the U.S. government will have to face into. Mm -hmm. uh, likewise, I think as NASA uh, has led the way and, and formulates some more commercial entities are getting in there, there's going to be more regulatory, I think, challenges that how do you regulate? So you approve, uh, I think you showed me the article. You weren't going to bring that up again, were you? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. You know, there's, <laughs> there's more, uh, as more commercial entities go into space, whether it be LEO or even further, uh, you know, what are now the new regulatory challenges? Because most of those rules were set up in the past where there's very little access out there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's going to challenge the next administration mm -hmm. as they go forward. And the more those multiplies, and you had 19 more you know, countries wanting to launch. Yeah. Uh, Traffic, be management. Traffic management. Traffic management will be huge. Uh, approvals. Uh, how do you approve someone that wants to go up and uh, mine asteroids or uh, mine the, the moon or other planets? Yeah. So I think that's going to challenge the authorities quite a bit to come up with uh, standards to go address that. And what about national security space? Uh, at least the, the issue that uh, even a, me at a farther remove can see um, is this, this uh, juxtaposition of, of big geo systems versus distributed, call them what you will, uh, LEO systems in terms of the architecture of national security space. Is that, uh, that's plainly an issue, and which again, I think, pulling on a theme that you're building here, it's probably not either or. Um, or, or, no, or what is your view, rather? Well, I would agree. Well, you know, the, I mean, the U.S. government has to set up its national security space policies and how they want to address that. Uh, we provision our business to handle either or. Sure. Right? You know, we need to be conditioned to support the U.S. government and be successful with them, whether they go small, large, or, or in between. <coughs> I don't believe there's a uh, single solution to support, you know, you know, one simple answer, <laughs> and we'll be positioned to help the government be successful whichever way they go. But I do believe you're going to see more of a hybrid kind of architecture if I were just to, you know, write an envelope, seal it, and let you sure. open it in two years or five years. Okay. Very good. Um, I was really struck by uh, the, the first, let's say, half of, of what you had to say, and a lot of the, maybe a lot, if not all, of the innovations that you were talking about are what me as a consultant would think of as process innovations. Um, very characteristic of you know, innovation in these mature industries of which, as cool and sexy as it is, space is now a pretty mature industry. Um, so you were talking a lot about a lot of process changes to take costs down and, and accelerate mm -hmm. speed. Um, and what, I, what, I, what it prompted me to wonder is, well, what about the product innovations? What's the next great mousetrap or, or trigger mechanism of, you know, are there, are there product, are, are there a frontiers of product innovation um, that, that you're also working on that, that, uh, that we ought to be looking for? Uh, the answer to that is yes. I intentionally left some of that out just okay. for competitive reasons. But, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> but no, I think you'll see uh, developments uh, in, our, in the product side in terms of some of the material sciences uh, okay. in that area. You know, getting into totally programmable uh, systems, both bus and payloads. I touched on that, you know, mm -hmm. in my remarks a little bit. And there's other technology that can be reapplied and go. Mm -hmm. So anything you can do to, you know, if you're a startup or someone in the room wants to start a company. Uh, anything you can do to, to miniaturize, reduce power consumption, right, and, and provide capability is really you know, important and when you're endeavoring out in space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, maybe almost finally, I probably have two questions and then we'll turn to those of you in the audience. Um, commercial um, space and, and the boundaries between these things, commercial, civil, military, I guess are, are increasingly bleeding, but 
is Lockheed Martin in uh, commercial space? And, and if so, how? Or at least what are your ambitions in what I guess in the vernacular is thought of as commercial space? Yeah, so uh, the, the dominant role in commercial space that we've been in the past um, <clears throat> is um, you know, on commercial communication satellites in, in that spectrum, which has been the dominant part of uh, commercial space till now, unless, you know, unless, unless uh, commercial companies go exploring. Mm -hmm. uh, so we've been active with that, probably have uh, done uh, a, a lot of satellites in that area. That's why we updated and modernized the 2100 satellite. Yep. Uh, so today we're, we've got three commercial satellites under construction, uh, 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 two for Arabsat, one for uh, JCSat. Mm -hmm. uh, as we go forward. Now, what you're talking about there a little bit is we kind of ca call this convergence, and okay, yeah. we don't know how to define it yet, but that's where the technologies are so similar, uh, and when you look at the, you know, the space and, and the resources are constrained, how does that converge? How does uh, government use more commercial? Commercial may uh, host payloads for the government mm -hmm. in, in that, that tie-in. You can even apply civil if you're going to do certain communications, you're going to take uh, you know, capability um, elsewhere. So how deep is that and what are the trouble around that, right? Uh, but there are, those are very complex. Uh, commu wideband communications or generic communications are pretty simple. But if you start hosting very sensitive uh, payloads that collect data, how do you uh, have uh, track custody and uh, certification of that information if you're going to act on it, right? A uh, commercial company doing communications doesn't have much risk. The, you know, right. the, the U.S. government deals with a lot of risk, you know, uh, as mm -hmm. they have to prosecute decisions on that information. So I think that's going to be a challenge area for a while. Not unsolvable, but it'll be a challenge area. Okay. And, and my last question might sound more like one uh, that you'd have, gotten, uh, you'd have gotten or Marilyn Houston would get on an earnings call, but, but at the same time, uh, I, I think it enli you know, enlivens the, the conversation here. And that is, what are the maybe five, as many as five, three to five programs that as the chief executive of your space systems company, you know, you're work waking up every day or every Saturday morning and focused on? What are the key priorities you know, pro project or program-wise uh, that the CEO of Lockheed Martin Space Systems is focused on? That's a good question. Um, I don't necessarily wake up every Saturday morning. I have good people, but, uh, but uh, maybe Saturday afternoon. No, a lot I'm of these I'm reviews, kidding. I'm told, are on Saturday morning, <laughs> but maybe not in your company. <laughs> uh, well, it's all, it's all relative. It depends what's going yeah, of on. Of course. Uh, no, uh, look, we're entrusted with some very critical programs for the uh, U.S. government, right? So uh, clearly, if you start on the defense side, um, continuing to produce, you know, the SIBRs and AHF programs and deliver those on schedule. Right. In, uh, in have contract, in production. In production. Um, but they're very complicated satellites and making sure you don't, you know, uh, miss a beat. Clearly, uh, right now, our biggest focus probably in that domain is getting uh, GPS-3, uh, the first uh, satellite ready, to la ready for launch. When's that scheduled? Uh, is this year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then the launch is not manifested yet. Okay. Uh, but but the, the the satellite, satellite. coming out will be uh, right. this year. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's a key one. You know, we've had some problems. You know, challenge with the payload. We think uh, you know, the majority of that's behind us. Working through a few uh, minor issues, and we'll be ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, so those are probably the three. Oh, we got a Mules launch, last of the five series for the U.S. Navy. Uh, at any launch is does keep my attention. Um, of course. Uh, you get to you know re-earn your grades uh, every time um, um, and stuff, and that's coming up by the way June 24th. So stay tuned to your TV. Okay. Mm -hmm. Clearly, uh, uh, we're, we're we're watching and, and uh, you know we work closely with NASA JPL on the Juno uh, yeah. uh, orbit insertion. Uh, that's important. Uh, Orion keeping that uh, on schedule and getting ready for that 2018 mission. Uh, uh, is very critical as well to us. And, and next programs, what's a, what's a competitive program over the next five years that um, you and all your competitors are going to stare hard at and, and work mightily on? Um, before I answer that, I, f I forgot to mention OSIRIS-REx. Okay. Uh, that's coming up soon, launch. Uh, that's a long mission, seven, eight years. And that's where we're going to come up to an asteroid and grab material off of uh -huh. an asteroid and send it back to Earth. So. That's a, that, that one's uh, got our attention, too. 
Yeah, I'm uh, sorry, let, let me, you're launching, that's launching this year? Yeah, it launches this when year. When does it get to the asteroid? Uh, I believe it gets to the asteroid, uh, I mean, I guess I can't, it's about a seven, eight year total mission. Okay. I don't remember the exact okay. time it gets so, there, so let me not, that's, that's I can not, say that's that to you. That's not this year's news flow when they get to the asteroid. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, just check. I'll, I'll call you and see if you're still working. Very good, very good. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, 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 competition, the horizon, uh, that's kind of what we're kind of, for the big ones, waiting, and it's going to depend on the government that comes out with their new policies, right? They're all coming out with their mm -hmm. uh, next uh, vision. It was uh, briefed recently by the U.S. Air Force, and we don't know which ones will compete next in the satellite uh, sector with that. So we're watching that one close. But there's a whole whole generation almost. There's a whole new generation. New system. Yeah, if you think about it, about every 20 years, uh, you know, if you fly out, <laughs> you, you basically go through and relook at every program and, recapitalize like any business with its own capital and then um, and figure out what their mission needs are and they'll prioritize whatever that sequence is. Yep. yep. Okay. All right. I will, uh, with pleasure, take some questions here from the audience and um, let's get the uh, staff with microphones quickly in hand. Uh, okay. And this woman right here, please. Thank you. Please, please stand up and identify yourself. Good afternoon. Give us one second. We ready to go? Okay, please. Good afternoon. My name is Pavia Lal from the Science and Technology Policy Institute. Thank you for your remarks. Uh, you were asked a question about, you know, what the next administration's policy issues should be or what should be the next national space policy. Uh, you called it strategy, but I think it's called the NSP, national space I, I policy. Thank you. I knew I didn't quite have the nomenclature <laughs> um, right. And I think the issues you mentioned, obviously, are very important, orbital debris, spectrum, et cetera, but I see them as sort of little P issues. There's a big P issue. From Lockheed Martin's perspective, do you think the next administration should pivot back to the moon or continue on the journey to Mars? That's a very important issue, obviously. There's a huge amount of budget issues that go in there, but your, your opinions are very hefty on this point. Sure, you know, that, that's, there's a lot of debate on that, uh, and there's a lot of countries that want to go to the moon. So uh, our, our team just recently put out uh, a plan on that where we'd actually go up uh, mostly cislunar. I kind of briefly touched in the remarks in orbit the moon, get used to, you know, uh, practice, you know, taking supply mission uh, and capabilities up to, to, to the cislunar uh, uh, vehicle. And then you have a choice. So if it's a multinational uh, participation, you have a choice to either go to the surface, <coughs> and some countries may choose that, or uh, and then also the next step, then we go to our uh, uh, Mars base camp, same thing, and orbit there. And again, you can go to the surface, go not. Uh, you know, there's a lot of environmental uh, issues around that, and we think we can robotically explore quite well. Uh, as for a policy issue for the U.S. government, um, you know, that's not my decision. Uh, there's probably some benefit to going to the surface, uh, practicing that close in. Uh, you know, now, you know, I know in talking to many uh, in the U.S. government, they feel, hey, we've done that. We kind of understand that. We, we want to get really out there and go deep space. So I think you can come up with a, a couple scenarios, uh, you know, with that, that would still, you know, meet the needs, what you're trying to do if you're going to go deep space. And it's, it's, a, it's always an issue of budget, right? So the real question is if it's very expensive to establish uh, presence, you're better off just, you know, staying lunar and then going to Mars, uh, ultimately. Other questions? Uh, there's a question right there in the fifth row. Again, please stand and identify yourself. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Olivia Wastanese. Uh, I'm from Avicent. Uh, we're a consulting firm here in DC. Um, so my question has to do with uh, new entrants in uh, LEO. So it seems like there's a lot of buzz in the space industry about uh, these mega communications constellations like OneWeb, potentially SpaceX, LeoSat. And so I'm wondering, um, you know, one of the other uh, facets of discussion on this topic is whether or not the market has changed enough since the days of Teledesic uh, to enable the success of these constellations with things like uh, the, the cost of access to space having fallen and um, you know, a number of other developments, uh, broadband penetration. Uh, so I'd love to know your opinion on uh, whether or not the market actually has changed enough to enable the success of these constellations, and if so, how will that impact the uh, market for commercial and government and military geocommunications? Uh, 
Deja vu all over again, Rick? I was going to say, yeah, he called me old to start out with, and I was around the 90s, so I remember all those. So <laughs> and all those uh, systems uh, and things. Um, uh, look, we model this a lot. Uh, and, and and There's some people have been critical of trying to do those systems. I'm like, well, look, you know, it's an innovation cycle. There may be some new breakthroughs of technology, new techniques. I, don't, I wouldn't propose ever breaking an innovation cycle. If you do, you know, I, there are some realities that you have to overcome with those systems. You know, what the, the launch costs, replenishment rate, <coughs> complexity in networks, and then the uh, issue of, um, you know, how do you generate sufficient revenue to deal with that? And when you know, anybody's been through grade school, you know, ge <laughs> geometry, geography knows you've got a lot of uh, coverage that's not generating revenue and about two thirds of that system, the system at a given time. Now, in saying that, I just I just kind of dated myself when I'm looking at through a standard revenue generation model, uh, you know, price per bit, whatever. Uh, some of the systems coming on um, don't necessarily generate revenue that way. If you look at some of the uh, uh, you know internet company models, right? Um, take a look at some of the big ones, the Facebook. They're not direct generating revenue. They're doing it indirectly through other forms of uh, um, advertising and things. So. You know, if they could come up with, a, again, a business innovation approach to send them and pull revenue in another model, it could work. And so I'm not sitting here today to say it, it wouldn't, um, though we run models on this and a traditional approach, it will be a, a hard putt from where I sit. Um, but if we get a breakthrough in launch costs, we get a breakthrough in some of the network management, uh, this miniaturization of electronics, in things, you know, it, it, they could have a really good go at it. Uh, question here in the third row, quickly, please. Ray, Ray, uh, let me see hands uh, of others who want to get questions in so that I can pace us here. So don't hesitate to uh, indicate so. All right. Hi, Michael Bruno with Aviation Brief and Space Technology. Politically, there seems to be increasing fear about sustaining NASA's mission into the next administration, no matter who's elected president. Well, uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure I'm smart enough necessarily to answer it in terms of the, the, the political aspects around that. But uh, the best uh, way for us to deal with that, and every you know administration takes a relook at what their priorities are. Uh, but we would argue that you know the best way is through performance, uh, continuing to execute uh, on Orion, having Orion ready to make its te you know test flight commitments, and meeting the objectives of the program. To, to show its value to both you know, the science but the exploration community is the best way to, uh, I think, deal with that. And, and hopefully people uh, know, you know, uh, as we move to space and we'll discover other, uh, you know, have new discoveries and other features and stuff that should help us uh, show that value even further. Question right here, please. Hi, Jacob Markish, Renaissance. Um, you mentioned uh, in your discussion with Steve the the balance between smaller satellites, disaggregated architectures, and traditional big ones. As you look at your government customer, and you look at not only the, the Leo Broadband architectures, architectures, but others, but other imagery architectures out there, <coughs> and other business models, what missions of the government do you think lend themselves more or less to this um, augmentation by smaller disaggregated systems? Is there do you, do you see any kind of priorities or mission areas that are especially either vulnerable or, or can take advantage of um, new and disaggregated systems? Um, that, that's a good question. I'm not sure uh, I'm smart enough to answer that because the government's been studying this with a lot of architecture, uh, um, you know, trade-offs and things and many, many I'm not exposed to. Uh, but you can look at, um, you know, systems, let's say you're, uh, take a, if you take a digital globe or something that does remote sensing, if they can get a revisit rate up or something, would that provide more value, right? You could see that where you want to have, maybe instead of revisiting once a day or once 12 hours, you want to do six hours, four hours, you could see something in that capacity there. And then, then as you all know, I'm sure you get in the question, well, gee, do I need the same resolution for the revisit? Uh, <coughs> 
So I just want to see if something's changed there. Uh, is it an earthquake? Is the bridge still there? Those kind of things. I think those, uh, anything you want to proliferate like that or have uh, more contact, you, you can, you know, prol proliferate, uh, I think, get some value out of. Uh, there's still physics, you know, as you go up in altitude, <laughs> everything needs to get a little bigger, uh, right? You need more power, you got R square losses, so, um, so then sometimes the numbers aren't there. GPS, uh, that orbit regime is really good. You got a lot of satellites in that regime uh, providing constant coverage, uh, which is very beneficial, I think, and that's in one of the trade spaces uh, that the government's looking at. Let me pile in behind that. Is there... Uh, do, um, is there an, uh, do you have a view of the architecture of constellations that will be most responsive to the need for resiliency, uh, both, both from attack of spacecraft as well as perhaps from um, just system failure in spacecraft? Uh, I don't have a specific architecture thing right. I would describe because, you know, basically with many, many nations that can go to space, that can go Leo, Mio, Geo, they have access, mm -hmm. it, it, it makes it a very complicated problem. So there will be no single solution, I think, that can solve, you know, be mission by mission, and then you're still going to have to, whatever happens, uh, you, know, you have to operate, right? If you have a storm, you drive a car, you operate through it, right? right. You're going to have to find a way to do that. It'll be a little of everything. will be some hardening, some redundancy, right. some network effects. Everything. All of that All and of some that. other things. Right. Right. Okay. I think there's a question right here. Yeah. But get, take the microphone, please. Thanks. I'm uh, moved to the side. I'm Jim Hasek. I'm a fellow here at the Atlantic Council. Can I ask you about another movie? About another about, movie? About another movie. Right. The, I, well, don't, I, wanna... I don't know if I saw it. But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's this space. Gravity. Uh, yeah, I saw Gravity. Okay. Uh, otherwise known as Sandra Bullock talking to herself for an hour in space. But um, <laughs> did... But I do want to bring that down to Leo and ask, actually ask the policy question. Did the movie scare the hell out of you? Uh, do you think about that kind of p potential cascading problem? Uh, and is there, because we're talking about uh, potential for attack, for example, uh, and do you think there's a, barring that, is there a policy solution possible, given the multinational nature of the issue? Yeah, well, Gravity, um, good movie, I'd say, had more errors uh, than Martian, maybe, uh, <laughs> in terms of things, but very, uh, you know, it was an entertaining movie. But, I mean, if you just put that in perspective, it's getting crowded in low Earth orbit, <laughs> right? And we mentioned, I think you used the term traffic management, that's what's going to have to take place. And whether it's an accidental incident <clears throat> or a deliberate incident, it just causes more problems, right? Because if something happens, uh, you have more debris, you, you have the risk for more uh, collision. And you have the risk to our astronauts, they gotta traverse that, right, at all times. And, uh, you know, you've got a lot of, uh, I think there's a lot of discussion right now between the, you know, the Air Force and the FAA, and how do you manage that, set up a regulatory policy level. But, you know, policies are good until someone breaks them, right? And, and in space, you, you don't recover fast. That debris stays up there a long time. It's a little different than, you know, other situations. So uh, I think this is gonna be a big challenge going forward. And that might be what the next administration really has to dig into uh, from a policy regulatory standpoint. Oh, uh, uh, Jacob wants a, a quick, a quick uh, tag on this. Uh, hold on, take the microphone, and then oh, we'll geez, go to the back. Quick follow-up to that. I was curious if you had any thoughts on the challenges or the dilemma between whether the FAA might be the optimal best traffic manager in space or DOD and the Air Force and the challenges of uh, nationally sensitive information? Not, oh. not, not my area to touch. <laughs> <laughs> back row. Question from the back row. The distinguished sure. gentleman in the back row. Thank you. Uh, Byron Cowan, Capital Alpha Partners. Um, I don't think anybody's ever calculated the return on investment the country got from the Apollo space program, the number of technologies that were spawned from that. Have you talked about the Mars mission, for example. Is there any way to think about some of the technologies that might come out? What are the really hard problems to solve from a technology standpoint that would have a broader impact on the economy? Uh, I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, it's it, you know a lot of people have tried to do that ROI on Apollo, and you almost get it gets more notional. Well, we know this happened, this happened. We had to solve this, and uh, it's probably worth trying to take a look at if you can project that now forward, what that would look like. But 
you know, we do know there's going to have to be a lot of technology development for that kind of length of mission, supplies, contingency planning, and, and, and those things that have to go into it. So um, you know, I don't have an answer for it, but it's a, it's a great idea. and It might be worthwhile, and, and we'd love to see companies that want to innovate in that area. I, I was thinking, Rick, of things that would have not just necessarily an aerospace impact, but you know, they spill into microelectronics and into, into other right. parts of the economy. I just don't know if there's if there's anything that sticks out from a Mars mission that, boy, if you solve that problem, it really has a much broader uh, range of applications in the economy. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I knew exactly what you were mentioning. I, I think it's a great idea, and uh, it might be one we can look at even help motivate some of the uh, entrepreneurs and startups to say, hey, help us solve this kind of problem, uh, or is this something you think you can take to a commercial market might help solve that next administration, <laughs> or uh, I'm sorry, it was either the political issue of uh, you know what's the value of this going forward. I think it's a good idea. The, the calculation would make a nice PhD dissertation for somebody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, uh, the calculus. Uh, yeah. Um, I I don't see another hand, but we have a couple minutes for me to. All right, now I do see a hand, but I'm going to actually get my question in ahead of it, and then we'll conclude with the question here. Um, I want to go back all the way to the, one of the first things you said. And I've heard it from you before, and that is that the, the ground control or the ground segment of space has an outsized importance to you. And I, for me, I'll, I'll confess, that comes across a little abstractly. Tell me more about that. Tell me more about what, what it is and why it has an outsized importance to you. Well, it's in a couple areas. If you go to very complicated missions, because uh, you know, we're always talking about the cost of a satellite. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, un unfortunately, we build our satellites to last longer and longer, <laughs> which is less business, right? We, we have uh, ones 20 years, 25 years. So if you do the, aside from the instantaneous contract value, if you do the math, the ground uh, systems cost will dwarf that satellite cost. Uh, the, 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 serve, the provision of that service or the hardware to manage yes, from the ground? all, all, all the that. above. Because okay. in, the, in the ground mm -hmm. system, then you're having to modernize every three to four years, new computers to keep things running, the software, the mm -hmm. folks. And, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, a heck of a lot of work's been done by every government agency, every commercial operation to drive that cost down. You do it through sometimes autonomy and things, but that cost can get high. Mm -hmm. And so what can we do? And now if you're unique per program, you're adding it as additive, right, to, your, to, to the to It's the not Earth every land or station that can manage certain of Correct. the Correct. So or if you had a challenge or there's an earthquake and damages station, it's not easy necessary to flip over unless you maintain your own backup stations. Mm -hmm. So the more we can get in there and have uh, drive as much commonality as we can, and, and I think this is what uh, General Hyten's driving in some of his vision, especially in the low Earth orbit regime. If you're common, now anyone who build, wants to build a satellite, if you know how to, you want to go monitor, you know, carbon emission, right, or, or whatever, <coughs> and you know now it's not a new design. You're not having to design the satellite, uh, the telemetry command functions, the interfaces. You know the standard. You can focus on the value of the data or the mission that you're trying to do. And that's the vision. This won't happen overnight, mm -hmm. but as you go forward, right? We're, uh, whereas, what I'm hearing you say is, whereas today, the ground control segment is as bespoke as the satellite, generally, is, 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 is unique, nearly. It, it, in most areas, it's very unique. Okay. Right. Okay. It, now, there are standard uh, suppliers to us we all buy and sure. try and standardize that, right? But they're, but they're being purposed in a fairly unique environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right now, you know, and uh, you know, as, as you move to that next level, so if you can set the ground up, we might in in this more open kind of system, standard interfaces. Now you design your neck. When you go to that next gen or recap those satellites, you actually know what that interface is. You can take co additional cost down. Okay. Okay. And the last question will be right here on the third row. Hi, Mike Gruss from Space News. I wanted to ask about your role. As the chair a little of, bit more loudly, chair, please. Chair of ULA. Um, obviously, we've seen SpaceX win the launch contract for uh, GPS-3. How quickly do you think ULA can become cost competitive with SpaceX? And the second part of that is, are Lockheed and Boeing, the other partner, interested in kind of providing that timeline? 
Um, well, the timeline's kind of set. Uh, my, my answer to that is uh, uh, ULA is going through a transition period to be more cost competitive, which means they have to ultimately neck down to a single uh, launch family. And that's what you're seeing now. And they're in that journey today. You've seen them announce their Vulcan Centaur uh, rocket. And uh, this year, you know, they're, they're, they're trading off um, uh, or running uh, in parallel. They got to pick an engine here uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, between the Aerojet Rocketdyne and the Blue Origin, uh, there. But uh, so that's all part of that that step st uh, stone as they go forward to to drive to that competitiveness. Um, now, uh, different business models each company runs. Uh, you know, um, ULA will stay focused on assured access to space for the government and some of those pressing missions. Stay focused on their mission success uh, track record. Uh, here as they go forward, so that'll, that'll drive into how they set uh, that rocket up. I don't know if that answered it. But. Thank you. No, this, okay. uh, this whole uh, event is, is, was really exemplary of what this, this series, this Captains of Industry series is about. Uh, we heard about the business, we heard about uh, a little bit about public policy, again that, that interface of ministries and industries and uh, so I, I thank you very much. One mm -hmm. of the uh, capstone observations I would make about the conversation is um, uh, I, I've been in other of these conversations where there's a certain presumption about, call it what you will, big space, incumbent space, that they are, they are somehow insensitive, um, is, is the way this argument, uh, I hear it sometimes, insensitive to this dynamism, and particularly the commercial and the cost features of this dynamism. That hardly would be the impression I draw off of this conversation, um, uh, which is uh, to your and Lockheed Martin's credit, and, and of necessity yeah. too, right? It's uh, how yeah. you stay in business now. Um, yeah. Innovation is yeah. everything. Okay. Well, thanks very much, and thanks to all of you for coming. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.